love. Hey, exciting and new. Hey, come aboard. Hey, ow, we're expecting you. If you have not already done so, please make sure that you like, share, and subscribe because it is so important to my success here on the YouTube. And if you do not have a retirement slash investment plan in place through your employer, please check out the Acorn app below. Find out how Google, Apple, JP Morgan, and all those other rich Motherfuckers can work for you. Now, let's talk about Morris Day's On Time, A Princely Life in Funk. I think this is part eight. Okay, lovers, before I get into it, if you recall a couple of videos back, I had asked for some of my subbies that were cash apping me to please let me know in the notes of the cash app if... I could uh, say your name in the video. So with that being said, Ms. Curry, thank you so much for investing in me and my channel. Now, let's get into it. I'm gonna call this part is uh, Morris the Victim, okay? I don't know if I'm gonna use that in the title, but I don't know, Morris kind of getting on my nerves because he got some issues within himself that he really needs to work out. Now, I told y'all that Morris Day and everybody that was involved in Prince's camp had Stockholm's real bad. You heard me, like real bad. Like, has Wendy and Lisa wrote a book yet? So I'm not basically he opens up with discussing the victim mentality. You know, he said that he was torn between the two characters that we talked about previously, Morris and MD. I mean, they the both the same niggas to me. I don't care. They all five foot six with freckles and big lips, okay, and, and a conk. I mean, uh, he but said he was torn because the, the line started disappearing between MD and Morris Day. At this point... He feels like he has to be this MD character, this cool character that was fueled by uh, sugary boogity and um, potted donuts and bitches in leotards and lace gloves and, you know, this persona of him in order to survive. He was saying that basically his ego and his pride had to be the MD person because that adoration from the fans was what fueled his ego. It's what he needed to continue. That was that drive that kept coming uh, out when he received all the accolades of being MD slash Morse Day slash Prince's buddy. And, I, and you know what I would equate that with? Instagram likes. You hear me? Like, I believe that people get addicted, just like he was talking about how he was addicted to the, the fame and the, the adoration from his fans. And then he even talked about how um, it was crazy how some of these fans would follow your every word. I told y'all, it's a whole bunch of crazy people out there just waiting for an opportunity to be laid. Listen. So now we get to the point where he's talking about he's um, interviewing background singers. Now, the first thing I thought was, ooh, I know that casting couch was a messy. But what he said was that it wasn't like that. He was all business when it came down to the background singers. Now, let me interject this. Prince, you are very lucky that the Me Too movement wasn't prevalent then. You heard me. Because that bull snit that Prince pulled on Morris Day when he was like, oh, could you just put a little makeup on my back? 
Oh, that shit would have got his ass sued. Because you can't ask anybody to just, oh, put makeup on my... That's not happening in 2020. You ask... If you ask somebody if I got a booger up my nose, oh, me too. I'm not trying to make fun of you bitches. I'm not trying to make fun of me too bitches. I told y'all I've discussed the rape culture before, back in the 80s and the 90s, back in Washington, D.C. I'm not trying to make fun for it. All I'm saying is that... Uh, yeah, that shiz that they was pulling back then on them women in them leotards and them lace clubs would not have happened in 2020. While he's doing the, um, interviewing for his background singers, he come across a young lady that was so captivating to him, child. He said her voice moved him, child. That's what I'm talking about. When you can come across somebody that moves you without putting their hands on you. Love, hey, exciting and new, hey, come aboard, hey, ow, we're expecting you, the love boat. So while the lady is singing, moving him along the seven seas over the love boat, Okay, he turns to the piano player and it's like, that one, I'm going to marry. And ladies, listen. Listen, ladies, listen. I know you're probably saying to yourself, why her? Why her? Trust me. Every dickity, doggity dude got one huzzy that will shut him down. Y'all bitches just got to realize that sometimes it ain't you. But when you with a ninja and you chasing him round and round the block, Girl, it ain't you. It's somebody else. It's Cookie. That's who it is. It's Cookie. He won Cookie. While you chasing him, he chasing Cookie. You're welcome. The young lady's name was Judith Jones. Her pappy was the first black engineer to work for NASA. Ooh, Morse. Ooh, ooh. Anyway, I wonder how. Uh, but anyway, let's move on. Judith Jones was also a Soul Train dancer, and he had did. She had did background vocals for Lou Rawls. He was like, oh, yes, this is old princess. I got to fornicate with the princess. And she was vaguely familiar with the time, but was a huge fan of Prince. And he liked that. Why? Why? Why would you like that? But uh, I digress. Morse Day do a lot of shit that I don't understand in this movie. But uh. so Morse Day turns the page and says, Prince was not happy. When I moved on, Prince chimed in and said, nigga, I told you I was proud of you. Moore said, say, well, if you was proud of me, why, when it was time for me to go on tour, you took Jerome and put him in your movie, knowing that I needed him to go on tour with me. You knew that would be an inconvenience. Yeah. You did a whole movie patterned after me. Your character was me. This is when Prince had to check him and say, you, brother, but did not make you, according to everything that you said, I, you were my alter ego, correct? You are an extension of me, correct? So how did I pretend to be you, brother? Once they said, well, what I heard was the next movie that you was going to do was going to be called The Adventures of Morse and Jerome. Ooh, could you imagine that movie? Them two running around the city acting a fool and Jerome holding the mirror up the whole time? Oh, that would have been funny, child. That would have been funny. Child, do I remember? Do I remember Under the Cherry Moon? But what Morse Day said was that Prince was around the south of France, running around with Jerome, hunching on girls, insinuating threesomes, uh... Thinking he was Rudolph Valentino. I said, ooh. Ah, do I remember that movie? Girl, I don't remember that movie. Do I, was it in black and white, y'all? Or was that uh, Under the Cherry or Graffiti Bridge? Was it black and white? I don't know. Prince chimed in and said, well, I was trying to be half funny, half romantic. Moore said, answer, no. Moore's day responds and says, well, I'm not happy that the film flopped, Prince. I would have told you that if you wasn't so dirty to me. I would have told you it was trash, you know, and then all the men around you was, you know, basically, yes, 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 Prince, yes. <laughs> yes, Prince, strong Jay Prince, yes! So, in this part, Morris Day refers to Marvin Gaye when Marvin Gaye was 
asked the question, what is your idea of happiness? He said, domestic bliss. Morse Day confirmed and said, what I think of happiness is the same as Marvin Gaye, domestic bliss, where I have the house, the kids, the dog, the white picket fence, all of that. Prince chimed in and said, nigga, you confused. You wanted all that, but you was that nigga that was on stage. You was that ninja on stage. So MD wanted a marital bliss. Are you serious? Oh, okay. Okay. Morris Day turns the page again and talk about how when he met his wife, Judy, that she was perfect for him. He was totally smitten for her. I told you bitches, there's always that one girl. That one girl. He married Judy in 1986. And then his second solo album, Daydreaming, dropped the same year. And then Judy was pregnant. Judy was the first to see that MD and Morris were two different people. Judy enjoyed Morris better. She liked Morris better, okay? Because maybe, you know, MD, you know, be round here dealing with them, you know, booger sugar dreams or sugary boogity dreams, okay? But... At any rate, she was like, listen, you when you come in the house, leave that MD nigga outside, okay? Leave him outside, come in the house, Morris. Another thing that Morris they said that I could believe was that she thought, meaning Judy, his wife, that Morris was a little crazy. Or MD was a little crazy, and she wanted that nigga to get help, okay? Morris they was like, I'm not getting therapy, I'm black. Nigga, you, you need therapy. If you don't get therapy before this book end, Negro. Overall, he rejected therapy because he didn't want nobody to be messing with his head. Meaning, I need MD to stay right there because that's what get me paid. And leave Morris alone. MD is inside of Morris, so you need to leave both of us alone. Morris Day says, MD made me a star. Prince said, no, Purple Rain made you a star, buddy. Morris responds and said, and this is crazy that I be like Morris, MD. Like he got me talking about these two different people like they two different people, child. But anyway, Morris responded and said, listen, I had a point to prove. And that's why I reached back to my brothers, Jimmy Jam and Terry Lewis. At that time, they had just got finished working with uh, Janet Jackson, child. They was burning up the charts with Alexander O'Neill, the SOS band, and Prince was jealous. Oh, his spirit was just. I know it was just because he's an old, jealous hearted motherfucker. That's what Prince is. He's either a jealous hearted mother hunchy. Morris Day is all selfish, you know, oh, woe is me, victim type motherfuckers. I know you like, nay, you being too hard. I don't give a, I'm telling you what I believe, okay? That's just what I believe. I'm not taking away from their artistry at all. I'm just reading this book and I'm just telling you what I feel about them mother hunchies from the book. Okay, don't be mad at me. Prince say, I wasn't jealous. Morris they say, so you wasn't jealous. Was you jealous when you went to Jimmy Jam house, skidded up in his yard, rolled the windows down and started blasting a song and was like, hey, can you make a song funkier than this? Oh, that's crazy. Of course Jimmy Jam's answer was yes. Well, I don't know. They was bad mother hunches. I don't know if they was like Prince bad. You know what I'm saying? I don't know if they was Prince bad. But Jimmy Jam and Terry Lewis was bad. Now the SOS band, oh that album was funky. Anything they did was funky. Morse also goes to say what I said earlier. Okay? How, you know, speaking of Prince, he says, Prince, you taught us everything. But whenever you felt like we were getting better, you freaked out. I told y'all, don't nobody in Prince camp surpass him. Nobody. Prince chimes in again and be like, oh yeah? Well then why I put everybody in Graffiti Bridge? I don't know why he put everybody in Graffiti Bridge. The way they talked about how bad Under the Cherry Moon did. I, I mean, I'm like, did he, did, uh, I'm, did he have any money left? So the Daydreaming album dropped in 1987 and the tour began in London in 1988. The song from the album Fishnet, was that the song Fishnet? Black pantyhose, something legs, show through the hole. At any rate, at the same time, Prince had Sign of the Times, okay? We know that song. Ooh, that song is a beast. That song is still 
mind blowing now in 2020 to just play these songs for these dumb dumb kids that don't know no better child something about charlie you know now he doing horse i don't know you know but you know them kids is lunching off them perks they call them 30s i don't want it clarence i don't i uh, i don't need that i don't mm -mm. now this is after the revolution disbanded why ain't nobody asking these people what the hell happened? I'm sure if they was to interview, interview anybody in regards to, you know, people that used to work with Prince, except for that damn Sinead O'Connor, because I told you that that thing right there, she is a hot mess. You know, one of y'all told me that she was a mess before she got with Prince. Regardless, y'all need to interview them people. But anyway, the revolution disbanded, and Prince had three hits on there okay so right after that album prince went into love sex you know the where he was on the you know on the, on the lilies sitting in it and he was like he was like that album didn't do well right prince was like well why did you talk about me being on the album naked i was just trying to reveal myself be raw give my audience full disclosure Moore said, just because you took your clothes off don't mean you took your mask off. I said, ooh, that's a nigga. Moore, they say, isn't it funny how all of a sudden you opened your arms to me when Love Sexy didn't do so well? Prince said, Love Sexy went gold. Morse they responded, but it ain't platinum, nigga. It ain't platinum. Okay, lovers, if you have not already done so, please make sure that you like, share, and subscribe because it is so important to my success here on the YouTube. Now, remember this, the same people you meet on the way up will always be the same people that you meet on the way down. Naysayers, my patron loves. Have a good one. Peace.